So right now we're going to talk about chapter 24.2 which is the transformer. And basically we need to understand how a transformer works in principle. So um, first thing you might be wondering is what is a transformer? You've probably all seen these little boxes um, that we uh, pl uh, all our electronic devices use when we plug in. And they can be used for example to charge our, iPo our iPods or our laptops or anything. So basically these boxes contain transformers and what transformers are able to do is that they can transform, as the name suggests, um, the voltage and the current in an electrical flow. And the current. The voltage and the current. Slash the current. And um, why do we need to do this? Well, if you, know, you probably know that your wall socket has a 240 volt power supply, but your iPod certainly doesn't need 240 volts to function. It just needs 5 volts. So this is kind of what the transformer does. And you've probably seen that um, these huge power lines and videos of things getting electrocuted. Well, those have a power supply in the tens of thousands of volts. And we certainly don't want that running through our iPod. That would basically fry all the internal components. And you might be wondering, why don't we just transmit lower power supply? Well, um, I'll be talking about that in my next video. It's actually, in fact, more more economic viable to transmit high uh, voltage, uh, tr transmit power in a high voltage form. But anyway, moving onwards. So now that you know what a transformer is, we kind of have to understand how it works. And this um, works by a principle we're kind of already familiar with, uh, known as electromagnetic inductance. And you've seen this before. Basically, if you have if you have a circuit here, and we have a second circuit here. We know if we run a, and let's call the orange one a primary, the primary source. So this is a, a, this is where our power comes from, and we'll call the second one our secondary. So let's say over here we'll connect to the circuit uh, our iPod. So pretend that's my iPod and the circuit there, and our primary cir circuit has the power supply coming in. So we know that the power supply will flow this way. And what do we know a uh, moving current makes? It generates a magnetic field, right? So let's take a look at this. Um, what direction would this magnetic field be in? Uh, the magnetic field would uh, propagate the magnetic field would propagate outwards. So if we use our right hand rule going down, uh, the motion of uh, uh, would, would make a magnetic field So what direction does this make a magnetic field? Well, we know that, let's use our right-hand grip rule, our thumb pointing in the direction of a current, our, thumb, our fingers wrap around in the direction of magnetic field, so we'll generate a field that looks like that. So basically over here, all the fields would be coming out of a page, over here. And what, do we, what have we done here? If we switch on this current, we've created a new magnetic field, which kind of propagates across here, and just kind of forms a magnetic field throughout all this. We've changed the magnetic flux linkage, and this flux will link to this co coil here. And remember our um, law of electromagnetic inductance? It was the EMF induced is equal to the negative change in uh, change in magnetic flux linkage, magnetic flux linkage over change in time. So what we've basically done is we've changed the magnetic flux linkage and that means we will induce a current, a, a EMF and a current. And you have to remember that this negative sign over here means that the EMF will be induced in the opposite direction of a primary one because um, this is kind of the law which is the conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So um, you, as you remember before, you might have remembered in a, one of our older videos, I showed you how when we take a magnetic field and I try and move a wire through it. This will generate an electrical current in here, but the energy that is used in electrical current um, will then uh, generate a resistive force to prevent this motion. So we have to keep putting new mo force to keep the motion going if we want to keep generating electrical field. Otherwise, we'd be creating free energy. And while that would be very advantageous, uh, the laws of physics simply do not allow it to happen. So when we move this wire across, it does it creates new energy in the form of well, it transforms this movement energy across here into energy of um, electrical uh, into electrical energy. Um, so here we have the same thing. Lenz's law tells us to, that the the, cha the change will uh, occur to resist whatever is causing that change. 
Uh, but let, let me just bring up a formal definition of Lenz's Law. Lenz's Law's formal definition is an induced current is always in such a direction as to oppose the motion or change causing it. So in this case, when we move a wire across, uh, it caused an uh, induced current, and the induced current caused a force, resistive force, which would oppose a motion. And, but this one here is slightly different. It's a new changing magnetic field which is causing it. So Lenz's law says it will induce a current in such a way that will uh, effectively oppose the uh, changing magnetic field. So what will happen here? Well, that is this. This will induce a current in the opposite direction of a current in this in this wire here. And if you imagine this right-hand grip rule again, this will induce a magnetic field going this way, which is just the opposite direction of what's happening over here, um, because uh, it will induce an upward current, which will which will generate this kind of oppositely magnetic uh, opposite magnetic field to this one. And you can see that this magnetic field is going counterclockwise, and this one is going clockwise. So they're effectively out of sync, and they will oppose each other. And this one will look like it will generate a field that looks like this. Uh, looks like that, and um, if you can if you can remember from before. Uh, from a top-down view, we'll have a magnetic. Uh, from a top-down view, our magnetic field lines will kind of cancel each other out. So, but what we've done here is look, we've generated a magnetic field. We've generated a current. We've taken a current from a first wire and we've used it and made a current in a second wire. And you might be thinking, hold on, aren't, doesn't this mean we're just effectively gaining free energy because we've just duplicated a current? Well, no, because what um, what people often don't realize is that a magnetic field in itself contains energy. So when this current uh, propagates this magnetic field, it kind of loses some momentum in, in propagating that mo magnetic field. And that magnetic field, inducing a current in this one, gives its energy to this to this um, to the electrons in this. When they start flowing, it, it, it induces an opposite magnetic field. So that the total magnetic field or the total magnetic flux linkage has decreased. And because the total magnetic flux linkage has decreased, uh, there has been loss of energy, which has been transferred into this electrical energy. So you can kind of see how the conservation of energy principle kind of plays into this. But just know that um, the, the current and the two white coils will always be opposite to each other. So what does a transformer look like? A transformer looks like this. If I can attempt to draw one of these. Uh, you kind of have an iron core, just like this. And the iron core, if you remember before, is because it increases the strength of ma our magnetic field um, by a po possibly a thousand times. So it's very, very advantageous. And basically, um, it will look like this. It will be a number of coils coming from a primary source. So this is a source coming inwards, like that. So let's pretend the current coming that way. And then you'll have a secondary coil that is also wrapped around here. And looks like that. Okay, so um, if you and you see, you have a number of coils here. So over here on the blue side, we have um, four coils, and over here on the orange side, we have three coils. Now here's the um, here's the crux of the argument um, that the power, the total power. Uh, well, for the purpose of our questions, we always assume that there's a hundred percent energy efficient transfer from here to here, which is obviously not true. And I'm going to list the reasons why we're not true in a second. But um, let's pretend, well, we always do pretend that it is 100%, just to simplify our calculations. But um, the idea is that the power from the, uh, this is the primary and this is the secondary. The power from the, um, the primary, uh, which is, sorry, I made a mistake here. The power from the primary, which is over here. So here we go, primary. Primary supply and secondary supply. So the power from a primary, which is V, V, uh, V one, I one, has to equal the power from a secondary, uh, V two, I two. And then we kind of just uh, have this law, which is based on that principle, which says the number of coils in the first one, in the primary, divided by the number of coils in the secondary, is equal to the voltage in the primary over the voltage in the secondary is equal to the current in the secondary and the current in the primary. So you, what we have to remember is the number of coils 
Um, the ratio is the same as voltage, but it's inverse with the current. And this is kind of just a law we have to remember. You don't really have to understand the reasoning behind it, but it's to do with how the magnetic fields interact and the magnetic flux linkage. And if you want, you can work out the formula. But um, that isn't really necessary. Just remember that this law is in place, and that's based on the principles of the need for the conservation of total power, and as well as the idea of magnetic flux linkage, being including the number of coils. Um, so why does a magnetic? Why is there a loss of power? These are the reasons for loss of power. There's a loss of magnetic flux between the primary and secondary coils, and um, this one makes a whole lot of sense. If you remember, magnetic fields radiate outwards in a um, in, in an inverse fashion. So as they radiate out, they lose the magnetic flux is kind of lost. So the distance here creates a loss of magnetic flux. There's resistive heating in the primary and secondary coils. So that's basically, you know, wires heat up when they're used, and that's quite simple. Uh, you have a high current running for a while, the wire will heat up, and the, lo uh, the loss of heat is loss of energy. Heating of the core due to eddy currents, and this is because, um, uh, because this is a soft iron core, it, it is a conductive material, and as a conductor, of a magnetic field will be induced, so it will be draining some of the energy from magnetic field. But what you can do to prevent um, too much energy being lost is you can laminate the core, because um, you have things called eddy currents running through it. And I'm just going to pull up a um, image of it right now. If you just give me a second, um, basically it looks like this. Um, here we go. Sorry, that's wrong. That's the wrong one. Here we go. So, um, if you look at this, you'll see that there, normally the magnetic field generates eddy current in the iron core. But if you laminate it, that is, you put non-conducting sheets between it, you will reduce all the eddy current in um, in each case. So, basically, you've effectively reduced your loss of energy. So that's a way to reduce the loss of heating due to eddy current. And the heating of the core due to repeated magnetism and demagnetism. And this is, again, just one of our um, fundamental principles of nature. So that's how why power is lost, and that's why it will never actually be a hundred percent efficient. But for the purposes of our questions, we always assume so. And um, if you take a look at what the actual current will look like, if you remember the current, uh, the voltage and and these will always be um, out of phase by one eighty degrees or two uh, or one pi, if you like. And that's because of the idea that the voltage is always going in opposite directions as to oppose each other. So if you take your primary voltage, or your primary current, sorry, that's a horrible line. If you take your primary voltage or your primary current, if your primary voltage looks like that, your secondary voltage will look like this. Here we go. Your secondary voltage will be compl uh, just be out of phase by half of wavelength. So it will start here, and it will look like... That, as you can see, so at any point in time between these two graphs, so that's V and that's T, any point in time between these two graphs, whatever value is here, it will just be the negative value in the other coil. So if that's a primary, that will be the secondary. And that's just the idea of Lenz's law again. The negative sign stating that um, the, 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 all, the changes are always to oppose each other and that uh, the direction of the EMF is always in the opposite direction of the induced flux, because it's always a gain of flux. But also, um, the last idea I want to leave you with is that if this current here, remember that um, EMF is only induced by changing um, magnetic flux, so if this current is constant and producing a constant magnetic field, what you'll, what you'll get is you'll get a spike in voltage caused by the immediate change, but then there will be no longer any uh, induced EMF. But the nice thing about alternating current is the voltage and current is always changing. So it kind of naturally has this property of changing magnetic flux. So there will be a constant injection of current here. But just remember, if it's a constant current going through, um, that's not that's a, uh, a direct current, it will, it will only induce a spike and then it won't induce any more EMF. Um, so thank you for listening to my video. Um, and please subscribe if you want to see more.